Welcome back, traders and investors. We have a good old-fashioned prop trader on the line, Justin Pulitzer. Justin, how are you doing today? Doing okay. Good morning. Uh, welcome to uh, Benzinga's pre-market prep, brought to you by Options House. Uh, so tell us uh, how you ended up in this crazy business, uh, your education, and how you ended up being a prop trader. <laughs> Oh, boy. Um, well, as far as education, I'm a native New Yorker. I was born and raised in Manhattan. I went to NYU's business school, Stern, and I have degrees in finance and marketing from that fine institution. As far as how I became a prop trader, it was sort of, um, I guess, very in vogue back when I was in college to, to trade. It was during the, uh, the dot-com boom, and I remember... My friends and I would go in, you know, before class, we'd all be hovering, huddling around the computers, you know, buying stock at Amazon and Qualcomm and then, you know, going out on bathroom breaks or after class and pumping out the stocks for 10 or 15 points higher. <laughs> so that's kind of when I got the, uh, the bug for it. And um, I had been in, you know, some various other businesses that I um, worked in. Uh, I had my own uh, marketing company in, in Manhattan for quite some time. And I had always kind of used my time to trade as well. So in about 2007 or so, I wound up doing it full time. And since then, that's just been what I'm doing. Uh, did you get did you get caught at all in a dot com bubble? You know, you had uh, the the buy, you know the run up, and you were buying it. Did you did you get caught holding the bag at all, or did you were you opportunist, Un op opportunistic? Unfortunate. Unfortunately, that was a very hard lesson. That was actually um, a, uh, a – I was just a kid at the time. I mean, I was only in you know my late teens, early 20s during that uh, time. I didn't really know very much about the markets. All I um, had to go on was the hype at the time. And, yeah, I made a lot of money, and I, I guess I lost a decent chunk of it too at the time. I will tell you, though, most of the um, – some of the most successful traders, I you know, I, I sometimes like to read their stories and their psychology, particularly like you know the Jesse Livermores and stuff. And before they all kind of made it big, I guess they all kind of had to pay their dues and go through you know a period of uh, baptism by fire, so to speak. Right. So um, you know, you like to, to stress uh, risk management, and uh, obviously that you have had some experiences on the downside of. How I mean, are you are you trading uh, stocks right now? Options? Uh, what are you trading, and how do you manage your risk? Well, risk management is really important. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think it gets enough attention. Um, the risk management strategy that seems to be, you know, I guess proselytized by talk, TV talking heads is sort of, you know, buy chase momentum and then just puke it out when the you know when it goes wrong, and. That, to me, is, is not risk management. That's just ridiculous. So for me, it, it has to do with the basic premise and structure of a trade. Um, a lot of people like to get their size too large. I think that the biggest trouble I've ever gotten myself into is when I'm trading in a size that isn't, I guess, um, good with my means. So what I always like to do is kind of start off small. Or if I'm going to start off big, it has to be at like a key inflection level, like a 61A Fibonacci level, but uh, a major moving average, a, a breakout point that's being retested or, you know, buying a, you know, buying a breakout on momentum and, um, you know, keeping that, that stop real tight so that if it does go against me, it, it, it doesn't do too much damage. I think the other mistakes a lot of people make are they don't structure their trades properly. They don't think about the downside. Uh, they only think, oh, you know, how high is the sky? So when I'm structuring a trade, I like to give myself at least three to one odds. You know, for every mm -hmm. dollar I can lose on the trade, preferably I'll make um, three dollars. A big, um, a big one for me also is the proper use of options. Uh, I talk to a lot of newer investors. I've, you know, I'm, I'm, I've, I have a fairly decent uh, following on Twitter. Um, definitely not the biggest, but I'm working on it. Um, and a lot of them talk about, you know, that they have smaller accounts and they're looking to kind of grow them. And I think that the mistakes that they make are that they don't really understand options. They don't understand the pricing of options or what they're used, really properly used for. And I find even when I talk to some of my friends that are skilled professionals that have worked in the industry for years, 
they all seem to think options, the right way to use options are for leverage. And for me, that has really never been the case. I always use them to increase my probability of a successful trade. Like, I like to sell a lot of out of the money premium, particularly when option prices are expensive. And, you know, if you can structure a trade where you have a 70 or 80% chance, I mean, imagine taking a bet on the Super Bowl and being told you have a 70 or 80% chance of your, of your bet being right rather than, you know, the 50 50 of betting the team, betting the teams. So, to me, that's the um, that's that's an important risk management strategy. Um, I had discussed with you earlier about people not realizing their portfolio exposure, and I can't stress enough beta weighting your portfolio uh, against major. I like to use the ETFs. Um, Spy is a good one, and also QQQ to know just how much your exposure really is. If you get a you know a downdraft of you know, a point in the spy or so on and so forth. Okay. I think, and, Go ahead. Uh, I, I'm sorry if I'm just, I'm just coming off too much. That's okay. Um, no, that's I, okay. I, that's all right. No, you, I, you're talking about good stuff here. Uh, but let's get to a little bit more specific here. Uh, coming into the open yes, here sir. up in a, a few minutes here. Uh, and uh, Wells Fargo came out. They beat by a penny. They were trading way up in the pre-market here. Um, very unusual for the stock to be trading up 60 cents and now trading down 60 cents here. Uh, so do, do you have any positions in Wells Fargo? I don't, I don't have positions in Wells Fargo, but obviously I'm a trader. I'm, looking at, I'm always looking at what's moving. And uh, I could discuss some levels with you in Wells Fargo. Sure, we trust. would love that. Go ahead. I'm just looking at the daily chart in Wells, and it, it looks like, first of all, it looks like it has poor highs. Um, it's, that's a market profile term. I'm not sure if you guys are all familiar with it. Explain it, it to us. Explain it to us. It, it means when you bang your head into price, and in the I guess the late buyers are not getting their reward, so it'll, they're very subject to liquidation breaks. This is, this is, by the way, been the story for the broad market for all of this year so far. You know, they, they run price up, and then there's not, you know, another buyer because I guess buyers are a little bit more cautious. And you keep banging into a level, banging into a level, and then, you know, there's a liquidation break where, you know, everyone kind of sells at once because they're not getting their, their price appreciation. So that is what I, I see in the chart in Wells Fargo up in um, that 50 close to 53 area. Yep. So you've, you've had Wells Fargo now. Today is not the, uh, there's the bell. Um, you've had Wells Fargo selling off for the last few days, and today you're opening right on the 50-day moving average and also a reference swing low. So I would look at the 50-94-ish, 50-98-ish yep. level. Yep. And, you could take that for a trade, and if you're you're either right or right out, I mean, you, you, I, I would actually take it in size, and that would be. It already looks like it's bouncing too. So right. that, that to me would be that to me would be like a trade multiple days down, looking for a, a bounce. Uh, it's not encouraging that the stock was up early and then down, but to me, what really matters is the opening 15 minute range. Yep. If it's a slow if it's a slow day like today might be because we the market opened up in the value area and it's probably going to be choppy and there was a decent range of a value area, I would probably um, take this trade with caution and, you know, use the opening. Obviously, this trade setup was off the 50 MA, so you take the trade right away and then you use the, um, I guess, the low of day as your stop there. If that starts getting violated, if, um, you know, you get stopped out at some point and you want to try Wells Fargo again, you could look at, Close to 50, like 49.97 ish, was a was a breakout range. Right below there, you have some slippage, maybe to the 100 MA, which is 49.47. And at that point, I would I would think it would it would, it would at least catch itself for for a bounce. I mean, it would be a pretty pretty steep decline for a stock like that. So so with um with you know with a stock like uh you know Wells Fargo, it hit you know 51.05, you know the pre market low just before it opened, and then so far the session is the 51.09. Um, I mean, you had the the major supported, you know, just under 51, 50.94 and 50.98. I mean, are you? I mean, are you are willing to step out? You know, ten twenty cents ahead of that number, 
or are you just more patient and you're going to wait to try and get filled at 51 even or below and kind of, uh, you know, minimize, you know, uh, minimize the risk on the trade? Well, for me, you have, um, like, like I just said, the stock opened up right on the 50 MA. So that, that's your trade. That's your entry. You know, okay. you're trying to buy it for, buy it for a 50 MA bounce and you know, you have, you know, some slippage a little bit below you. Um, I usually, I mean, if you take a look at those candles, those, the, the, those had both stopped on the 20 MA. It's a little dis- disappointing that you're below the 20 MA now. Uh, that usually, to me, is a is a sign of health in a stock, particularly in Apple. If Apple is above its 20 MA, it's usually a a buy the dip situation. If it's trading below the 20 MA, it's a it's sort of a sell the rip situation. But in in Wells, like we like we said, we happen to be opening right there. So for me, that's a right or a right out trade. Okay. Um, I, I personally, when you have a gap situation, I like to use the opening, um, the opening 15 minute balance. Particularly if I have, I, I, I'm not in Wells Fargo, but if I w- if I had been long Wells Fargo and I was long from higher prices, I I wouldn't just puke the stock because it, it opened up, you know, down on me. I would wait and see what the opening balance is, and particularly on an earnings day, if it if it starts taking out the low of the day, then I then I'd probably be stopping out. But this is this is a unique situation where you're opening up close to prior lows and on a 50 MA. So that would be, you know, you're either right or right out. And if you start breaking that 50, I'm, I guess you got to start thinking about the short side. Okay. Uh, good. Uh, and what would you, and what would you be using as a tight, you know, just for a shorter term trade here, what would you be using as a target on the upside? Oh, for Wells? Yeah. Um, I would look where the stock started to break down. Um, around 52 ish it, it seems to have had some resistance so okay. i would probably buy it and trim trim some of my trim some of my profits up there it looks like the, i mean you had some wicks there so you might start seeing some more of the distribution around like 52 29 ish mm-hmm. okay um I, I would be looking to that or if you really want to get um technical you can do a fibonacci retracement and I'd probably be looking at trim profits at the 38.2, and then you know, the if you start getting up to maybe half back, that would be for me the, the trade. Okay. And uh, what uh, did, what indexes do you like to follow? Uh, I mostly like to look at the. Um, I mean, you know, the media will give you a lot of talk about the um, about the Dow Jones Industrial Average, but I, I mean, I, I almost never look at those. I I look at the S and P. Um, particularly spy, I I like the those ETFs. Um, they're just they're just good. Uh, they seem to be traded. They're very liquid. They have a lot of options on them. Um, so I look at spy, QQQ, and IWM. And uh, is there a leader in a laggard? As far as stocks, um, well, um, as, yeah. I mean, I as far as yeah I, indexes too. I mean, uh, well, oh, not, the, yeah. the indi- I, IWM seems to be one that a lot, the media has been seeing off on more a lot lately. Um, a couple of months ago, when even a couple of weeks ago, I should say, when you had that you know precipitous decline, it seemed like. I mean, a couple of years ago, all the funds were using spy at, or S and P minis as their their sort of their short hedge. Um, I think that the tr- stocks that they're trafficking in may have, have changed, so I think that they've been using IWM a little bit more as their hedge, and that seems to be a bit of a leading indicator when you get some weakness in that or in the queues, you start seeing some, some I guess, more, I guess that's sort of the, the sign that the market might be correcting a bit. Um, you're talking a lot about technicals here. Um, is there any kind of uh, fundamentals that you pay attention to, or do you pretty much? I mean, you talked about Fibonacci's, double tops, double bottoms. Uh, do you, do you pay attention to the fundamentals at all, or uh, ratings changes by the big banks? Um, well, let's. That, that's two questions. So let me let me address that. Uh, yes, I do pay a lot of attention to the fundamentals. Um, for me, it's not just the technical. Um, which is brew. It's sort of a, an amalgam of technicals, fundamentals, and then also a macro view. And mostly of that has to do with credit availability and money flow into the market. Um, that's when you seem to have the real big corrections when people are pulling their money, sort of they're not there to be the next buyer. But as far as technicals, yes, those are very important, um, particularly with the type of market we're in right now. You have a lot of short time frame traders. It's a lot of day traders in control. 
um, and algorithms, and they all look at the same thing. So that's how you, you, you key off of. As far as fundamentals go, I look to, I mean, if, if, a, if a company or a stock is in, you know, a state of incline or decline, so to speak, if the fundamentals of the company are breaking down, like a dip in BlackBerry, you know, a couple of years ago, a lot of people could have just said, oh, buying on the technicals, but obviously they weren't innovating and they weren't keeping up with iPhone or Android. So for me, I had been very bearish on, on that stock. So it wasn't one I would have, you know, stepped into on a buy the dip situation, so to speak. I use the fundamentals to help me determine which stocks I think are buy the dip type of stocks or ones that are sort of sell the rip stocks. Okay. Like I'm, I've been pretty bullish on Facebook for a while. Um, after being negative on it from the IPO, I turned and I was very bullish around $20. I was about a dollar too early, but uh, I, had, I had thought that the total, you know, the street didn't really understand the Facebook story, and I was willing to take a uh, shot there because I thought the risk reward was, was good. Uh, and uh, what do you think of Facebook now? I still like Facebook, actually. Um, obviously, it's, it's a very different story. It's not really a pioneer's type of stock like it was back then. But I would be very surprised if the highs are in for Facebook. I've been looking for it to uh, re-challenge that 71.44 high and make a new one. Um, it may take earnings to do it. It may have to correct more before it gets there. But I would think the stock probably has more to go. Okay, uh, Wells Fargo is holding up for you here. I know I don't know if you guys were able to get a trade off it, but it is holding just above the fifty-one dollar level. And uh, interesting, the S and P's are coming off really hard right now. Uh, is there a, now for me? I'm looking at this, and I don't see any major support until we get down to uh, to yesterday's low. That's about ten handles away from here. I don't know if we have the gas to get there. Uh, what, what's your what's your outlook of you know for the market for the remainder of the day? I see a little bit of support before there. You have um, 1952.75, which is the value area low from yesterday. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't be surprised to see it um, take a little bit of a bounce there if we if we get that low. Uh, it doesn't surprise me that we're having a bit of a, uh, a liquidation break on the open. You had overnight inventory that seemed to be mostly net long. Those buyers are the weakest hands, and as soon as you start taking out overnight lows, they all you know react the same way and puke it out. Okay. I think for the bull. I think for the bulls, it's probably better that you have a weaker open rather than a, a strong gap up that would get sold into all day long. Okay, uh, Theo is in here, and uh, he's asking about Twitter here, and uh, and uh, you know how it's trading vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Facebook in price. What uh, do you trade Twitter at all? I do. I, I actually uh, have been. Tra trading Twitter lately from the long side, I think it um, has some potential to get back up to about fifty dollars. Um, I think they need to start reporting some better quarters first, though. It, it, it seems to be the same story as Facebook. I think Facebook is better than Twitter. I think it's a better managed company. I think Mark Zuckerberg is is a genius. I think Twitter, though, is is a great, very unique product, and particularly for news media. I just don't think the street understands the story, and I think that Twitter needs to learn how to monetize their users better. The um, Facebook, you know, the, the bare argument with Facebook is that, oh, you know, I'm tired of looking at my pictures of my friends' kids and their dogs, and, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's sort of like this dumb type of feed as opposed to Twitter being a little bit more, you know, intellectual. But there is no other social media that is as deep as Facebook. Face, there is no alternative. I mean, there. I guess MySpace at the time was, but they've kind of gone, you know, the way of the dodo. And I don't really see any other company being able to um, to take Facebook at this point. They just have too many too many users. With regard to Twitter, I mean, the stock is obviously still, you know, below trend. I think the I think they just need to, uh, you know, to have a good quarter and kind of convince the street that they're able to monetize this this amazing property that they have. I mean, most traders are, are on Twitter. I think most people understand and like the product. They just need to get the public on board with some user engagement and probably become a little bit more Facebook-like. And uh, where does LinkedIn fit into, uh, you know, all of this? Uh, they've, you know, had their all-time high. They've come off kind of kind of flying under the radar. What's your, what's your short-term and long-term outlook for LinkedIn? 
Wow, LinkedIn's a pretty ugly one, right? I mean, that stock has been in a pretty uh, protracted uh, decline for, for quite some time. Uh, you know, it's funny. I had I had never really understood the LinkedIn story when it was on its way up. Um, I mean, I've traded it from both sides, from long and short, with varying degrees of success. Mm-hmm. Uh, my story with 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 LinkedIn is, I think it was a very, um, it was sort of the unemployment play, that when unemployment was really po- posting terrible numbers, the, the 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 story of the stock was that people were using it, you know, to post their resumes and try to leverage their contacts to try to get jobs, and. I guess the job numbers have quote unquote been getting, I think they're terrible just, you know, but um, if everybody seems to be the consensus, it doesn't really matter what I think about it with the street things that if that's getting better, that maybe this is coming, you know, that LinkedIn isn't benefiting from the same type of trend that they were in the past. Okay. Uh, and just a uh, final advice for, you know, people that are, you know, either new to investing in the market or interested in getting trading. What, uh, what would be your best advice for them? My best advice to them would be to never max out their margin. Um, if you get yourself too levered up, you're going to have to sell when you really don't want to. And if you keep your size in order and you keep your money management discipline with regards to taking losses, and I'm talking about stay in business type of risk, like I never like to let my portfolio get more than 10%, five, really 10 to 15% below because once you start getting below those reco- those rates, the recovery is very asymmetric. Like if you lose 10% in your portfolio, it only takes about 11% to get it back. But if you lose, you know, 20%, you need to start getting 25% back. 30%, you need to get like almost 43% gains to get that back. So it starts becoming harder and harder to recoup money after losses. So keep your losses small. Don't max out. Don't max out. Don't max out your margin because you'll blow up at some point. And, um, you know, stick to price levels, you know, honor your stops. I mean, it's, this is the stuff that uh, most people, I guess, kind of know they've, it's been told to them. I just don't think they do it. I think people know the right thing to do. Sometimes they just don't like to do it. Okay. Uh, Wells Fargo did get a quick pop up the 5149. I uh, tried to fill the gap from yesterday, 5153, but, uh, Little bit too much market pressure here, uh, keeping uh, keeping the uh, the pressure on Wells Fargo. Well, Justin, uh, thanks a lot for coming on. Uh, we like your approach to the markets and uh, the lessons that you're trying to teach our traders. Things that we talk a lot about um, on our show, and uh, we'd like to certainly have you on again if that's possible. Yeah, sure. It was, okay. uh, it was fun. Okay, thanks, Justin. Have a good trading day.